é uma noite muito especial para nós. Nós temos a participação uh, de dois panelistas muito importantes e que a gente agradece muito a presença. Fico muito feliz de termos aqui a Rihanna e o Greg. Primeiro a gente vai ouvir a Rihanna e em seguida o Greg. Uh, os temas que vão ser discutidos aqui, uh, na verdade, é uma, a gente está fazendo uma tentativa de olhar, então agora, a partir dos debates que a gente veio tendo ontem e hoje, uh, para uma perspectiva mais internacional e inserir uh, essas perguntas uh, dentro de um contexto uh, mais amplo. Né? Tenho certeza que vai ser uma oportunidade única de aprofundar esse debate. Uh, a gente vai ter uma hora para conversar com a Rihanna, ela vai fazer uma apresentação e em seguida a gente vai abrir para perguntas. Então, sem mais delongas, já agradecendo, uh, com a palavra a Rihanna. Good evening. Uh, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you to the Internet Lab for bringing me all the way from Silicon Valley to speak to you all tonight. I'm very honored to have been invited to talk to you about my topic, which is the debate in the United States over the tension between encryption and law enforcement. That debate is fundamentally one about power. Who gets to have it? Who decides whether they have it? Who does or doesn't want them to have it, and why, and what it's used for? Humans are tool-making animals. We invent new tools, new technologies, to empower ourselves. New technologies are supposed to help us do the things we do better, faster, stronger, more efficiently, in greater number. And they enable us to do new things we couldn't do before at all. That's true of a telephone, it's true of a dishwasher, it's true of a machine gun. Each of those technologies changes the amount of power that its user holds. So who has those tools becomes very important, especially if you're someone with more power than others have, and you want to keep it that way. A lot of new technologies aren't made available to lay people, particularly when they're first invented. Maybe they're kept secret so that the inventor has a military advantage, like how to make nuclear weapons, or an economic advantage, like how to make Coca-Cola. And even if it's not secret, a new technology may still be very expensive at first, which keeps it out of average people's hands. But secrets get out, and prices come down. So when a technology becomes widely accessible to everybody, not just the military, or the elite class, or a handful of businesses granted permission from the king, then the people who hold power start to get nervous. That's because the technology reduces the gap in power between them and you. That's why, for example, England used to require licenses for printing presses, or why Saudi Arabia still won't let women like me drive a car. And it's why law enforcement in both your country and mine is so nervous about encryption. The debate over encryption is just the latest chapter in the centuries-long history of authorities' discomfort with popular access to technologies that empower people to exercise their human rights, such as privacy and free speech. The police are used to having access, and they're used to access being their thing, not your thing. They're accustomed to being able to keep tabs on your communications and your data and they're used to most people being unable to effectively keep them out. But bear in mind that their customary access isn't something that the government is entitled to by some natural law or God-given dictate. Our two countries' constitutions and laws set out what law enforcement may and may not do. If law enforcement agents want access to someone's information, the constitution and laws tell them what information they are permitted to get and the proper way to get it. But those laws are not about the police's ability to access information. They just tell police what procedural steps they have to follow to get it. That it's possible to get it was always taken as a given. That's what encryption changes. Law enforcement is used to being able to access information with the right court process. Making encryption commercially available to the general public impairs law enforcement's underlying ability to access information even with the appropriate legal authorization. The first big threat to that capability in the United States came in the early 1990s when the private sector first started in earnest to develop software for commercial use that included encryption as a feature. The law enforcement and intelligence communities in the U.S. were not happy. The government tried to bring commercially available encryption under its control both domestically and abroad. We call this era the crypto wars. On the international side, the U.S. regulated encryption as a munition and strictly controlled its export to other countries. The U.S. was used to being the world's superpower, a status maintained in part through its military and intelligence services. If other countries had encryption as strong as America's, then we wouldn't be able to spy on you as well anymore. 
Some U.S. companies responded by offering two versions of their software. One for U.S. users like me, and one with weaker encryption for international users like you. That's not to say the U.S. government was totally comfortable with Americans having access to strong encryption either. Domestically, our National Security Agency, or NSA, tried to get the U.S. private sector to adopt a device called the Clipper Chip that would encrypt phone calls, but which had a built-in backdoor for government access. But by the end of the 90s, both the foreign and domestic efforts had failed. The Clipper Chip was never adopted due to backlash by privacy activists and the discovery by respected cryptographers of critical vulnerabilities in its encryption protocol. The export controls were gradually eased due to economic pressures to keep the U.S. competitive on the global market. There are also legal challenges in the courts contending that the export restrictions violated the freedom of expression. And in the end, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Encryption had become available to the general public, and it was here to stay. So the crypto wars had been won. It was in this period in the 1990s that we started hearing U.S. law enforcement first sound the alarm about the perceived threat of criminals shielding their activities from detection through technological means, including encryption. U.S. law enforcement's name for this threat is Going Dark. Our federal law enforcement agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, took this concern all the way to our Congress, which in 1994 passed a federal statute called the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA for short. CALEA requires communications carriers to make their networks and equipment technically capable of being monitored by law enforcement. It guarantees that when law enforcement agents get a court order authorizing them to listen in on a target's phone calls or record the phone numbers he calls or is called from, the agents will be able to go to the carrier and implement that court order. But there were three important limitations to CALEA when it was passed. It doesn't allow law enforcement to dictate or prohibit specific designs for carriers' equipment, facilities, services, or features. As originally written, it exempted information services, which means the internet, and it says carriers aren't responsible for the decryption of communications their customers encrypt, unless the carrier both provided the encryption and possesses the information necessary to decrypt the communication. That means that carriers are free to provide encryption, which they don't have the ability to remove. These limitations were the result of an intense fight between law enforcement, security experts, and civil liberties groups over the language and scope of CALEA. CALEA reflects a balance that the members of Congress, who are accountable to the public, struck among competing interests, including public order, security, and privacy. The process involved mountains of evidence and expert testimony. The outcome was something that, to law enforcement, was a preservation of their power, keeping the status quo. But many in the civil liberties community believe this compromise gave up too much ground despite those carve-outs. Plus, a decade later, the FBI got CALEA expanded to, co to cover internet broadband providers and certain VoIP providers, which further upset the civil liberties community. And that wasn't the end of the FBI's efforts to expand CALEA. In 2010, the FBI pushed Congress to force all communication systems, like Gmail or Facebook, including all encryption software, to include backdoors for law enforcement access. They cited the problem of going dark in an age of ubiquitous internet-based services. But the proposed bill died after a public uproar. In 2013, the FBI again urged Congress, again without result, to extend CALEA to all communication services so that companies with messaging services would have to backdoor their products and decrypt all encrypted messages. Those are the episodes that tie the 1990s crypto wars to the new crypto war. If passed, the FBI's proposals would have undone two of the three exemptions I talked about that had been laboriously carved out from CALEA in 1994, the internet carve-out and the encryption carve-out. The FBI had already taken a bite out of the former through the broadband and VoIP expansion, and its 2010 and 2013 efforts were attempts to finish the job. But in its public relations efforts, the FBI painted these campaigns to extend CALEA as merely an attempt to preserve the status quo of access to American's communications, not as an expansion of law enforcement powers. So that was the mindset that the law enforcement community in the U.S. still had as of September of 2014, when the new crypto war started in earnest. That was when Apple announced iOS 8 for the iPhone. Starting with iOS 8, Apple would provide default encryption for iPhones that not even Apple could bypass for law enforcement. In prior versions of iOS 4 through 7, Apple could bypass the user's passcode and extract certain categories of data pursuant to a court order. In iOS 8, however, the files on the device are protected by an encryption key that commingles the user's passcode, which Apple doesn't know, 
with the device's unique identity or ID, which Apple also doesn't know. In short, even if police got a warrant to search an iPhone, Apple couldn't unlock it anymore. This made American law enforcement authorities furious. James Comey, who until a few weeks ago was the director of the FBI, went to the press and to Congress, and his warnings echoed what the FBI had said in its attempts to extend Kalia, namely that terrorists and pedophiles would be able to go dark, this time with Apple's help. This rhetoric was the 90s crypto wars all over again, but this time it wasn't only access to communications that the FBI was worried about. With iOS 8, the issue was encryption for data at rest on our now ubiquitous smartphones. Just like in the 90s, law enforcement's attitude towards iOS 8 was that they were being deprived of something to which they had a right under the status quo, which guaranteed them access to those devices. But that wasn't so. This source of evidence didn't exist due to a God-given edict or the natural order of things. Apple voluntarily started making iPhones in 2007, and they quickly became a treasure chest of information all collected in one pocket-sized place. And of course, law enforcement loved that. But investigators only had access to the data on iPhones because Apple had decided to build them that way. They were free to make that decision, and now with iOS 8, they had decided not to do that anymore. And Apple was free to make that decision too. Apple would continue to comply with search warrants and court orders to the extent that they could, but now they couldn't bypass their own advanced encryption. Apple had opened up those treasure chests to law enforcement, and now it was yanking them away. And if iPhones weren't so popular, at least in the United States, as well as abroad, where the bulk of iPhone sales happen, then maybe it wouldn't have mattered so much to the FBI and their law enforcement colleagues. Like I said, what scared law enforcement about crypto in the 90s was that it would become readily available in commercially available software and hardware products. Law enforcement is used to having access to your information, but they're not used to you having easy access to ways to protect your information. But the sky didn't fall after the 1990s, despite the relaxation of export controls and Kalia's exemption for encryption. Yes, commercially available encryption became widely used to secure internet traffic, e-commerce, banking transactions, etc. But encryption wasn't all that commonly used by consumers for laptops or mobile devices or messaging people or browsing the web. You had to find a tool that would work on your setup, and then you had to learn how to install it, configure it, and use it correctly. Encryption products have long been very, very user-unfriendly in design. They made encrypting stuff a big pain, so most people just didn't bother. But what's Apple known for? Apple's known for clean design and ease of use. And now, in 2014, Apple had turned that expertise to device encryption for its highly popular iPhone. So suddenly, millions of people were going to have easy access to strong encryption for the vast amounts of data on their, on their smartphones using just a passcode a few characters long. They didn't have to affirmatively seek out, download, and install special software. They didn't have to mess around with settings and menus. It just worked. And that's what scares US law enforcement, and probably Brazilian law enforcement, too. When he was the FBI director, James Comey acknowledged that determined, sophisticated criminals and terrorists will always find a way to get access to encryption, no matter what US law says, no matter what Apple does. But those individuals are going to be relatively rare. Most criminals are going to stay unsophisticated, and they're the ones involved in everyday crimes. With strong encryption available by default on a smartphone, police may be unable to get into the phone when average people commit average crimes, which is the day-to-day -day work of police and prosecutors. So default encryption on consumer devices in widespread use is a big game changer. And it's perfectly legal. Under U.S. law, Apple is free to design iOS as it pleases. There's no law saying Apple can't design its phones to have strong encryption or requiring Apple to put in only weak backdoor encryption or otherwise ensure access for law enforcement. The tree that had been planted in the 1990s in the earlier round of the crypto wars had finally borne fruit. Apple's at liberty to make a smartphone it can't open for the police, not even with a warrant. So the 2014 announcement of iOS 8 turned the tables on the former status quo of access for me, but not for you. The lid was closing on that treasure chest, so what was law enforcement going to do? Well, making iOS 8 wasn't illegal, but maybe that could change. So, Director Comey and his colleagues proposed to pass a law that would force the status quo back to where Apple had voluntarily set it pre-iOS 8. He and other officials called for legislation to require phone manufacturers to build backdoors and device encryption or else face criminal fines. The idea was that authorities could use these backdoors to access encrypted data, but that the backdoors couldn't possibly be exploited by the bad guys. 
The law enforcement officials calling for this idea didn't offer any specific technical details of how that would work. They left that up to the mayors in Silicon Valley. But the idea sounded just like Clipper Chip 2.0, and it was just as roundly denounced by cryptographers as the first one. Law enforcement tried to paint Silicon Valley tech companies as being stubborn and unwilling to come up with a solution that could totally be invented if they would just work harder. But cryptographers responded that it wasn't about stubbornness. What law enforcement wanted was simply impossible. If you put a backdoor in your encryption software, it cannot be limited just to the good guys. It can and it will be used by bad guys too. Cryptography is just math. It doesn't work one way for police and innocent people and another way for criminals. Math works the same way for everybody. And for authorities obsessed with power dynamics, that's apparently very hard to understand. So far, the legislative approach to dealing with the going dark issue in the United States has gone nowhere. President Obama was surprisingly indecisive about going dark, despite a popular petition to the White House asking him to take action to protect encryption. In 2015 and 2016, Khalid Part 2 type bills mandating that mobile device encryption be law enforcement accessible were introduced in three American states, California, New York, and Louisiana. None of those bills went anywhere. Two senators in the federal Congress, including one of the senators for California, the home of the big tech companies, wrote a bill in 2016 that would have mandated that companies be able to comply with court orders to decrypt information. But when a draft of the bill went around, it was so poorly written, and the underlying idea was so ignorant and unwise that the bill never even got formally introduced in Congress because the outcry from cryptographers and civil liberties advocates was so swift and so strong. So up until our presidential election last November, FBI Director Comey seemed to have given up on the idea of a legislative solution for going dark. <clears throat> Instead, he said that law enforcement would have conversations with tech companies to try to persuade them to voluntarily change their products. Instead of an open legislative process conducted in public through politicians who are accountable to their constituents, <clears throat> Comey plans to put pressure on companies like Apple behind those doors. They changed his story after the election. He hadn't succeeded with Obama, but Comey said he planned to bring the going dark issue up again in front of the new Congress and the new president. Maybe 2017 would be different. Well, 2017 is very different. The new president fired Mr. Comey in early May, and as of right now, unless something's been reported since I started talking, which is totally possible, we don't know who's going to replace Mr. Comey as the director of the FBI. Nobody seems to want the job for some reason. So it's not clear what stance his successor is going to take on going dark. But that said, I doubt the new FBI director is going to be more friendly to encryption. The new director is going to be appointed by a president who has no interest in complex technical or policy issues, and who during the campaign called for boycotting Apple for its refusal to help law enforcement. On the other hand, our Congress has been rather busy with other things, some of which also involve Mr. Comey, who's supposed to testify to Congress soon about Russia or something. And the United States <coughs> public is politically engaged in a way that we haven't seen in years. And we really love our iPhones. So the going dark legislation that Mr. Comey wanted probably won't happen anytime soon, if it ever happens at all. So that's the legislative landscape in the US. As of right now, encryption is legal in the United States, period. But the legislature is only one branch of government. Law enforcement's been pursuing its going dark agenda through our courts as well. So unlike Brazil, we have a common law system, not a civil law system. Um, but similarly to what I understand is the case here, the courts rely pretty heavily on published judicial opinions in our system as well as in your system. Um, so in a common law system, a federal court opinion saying that the law authorizes the FBI to conduct a certain private surveillance is really valuable to them because then the FBI can point to that opinion the next time they want to get go to another federal court and ask for another surveillance authorization in another investigation. And it turns out the FBI has gone to court quite often about encrypted iPhones. I'm going to talk about the Apple versus FBI case in a moment, but that wasn't the first time the FBI had gone to court to make Apple help it access an encrypted iPhone. From at least 2008, soon after the iPhone came out, until late 2015, law enforcement had gotten dozens of orders from federal judges telling Apple to bypass the code on pre-iOS 8 iPhones for which law enforcement had obtained a warrant. You'll recall that that's something Apple could still do before iOS 8. All those court proceedings happened under seal. Like private meetings with companies behind closed doors, going to court under seal that the government operate outside the light of public debate. And in their applications to the courts, the government's lawyers didn't cite any statute specifically authorizing the unlocking order to Apple that they sought. That's because there isn't one, and sometimes they would admit that. 
Instead, they'd argue that the requested order was authorized by a law called the All Writs Act, which dates from 1789. The All Writs Act, or AWA, acts as a gap-filling, catch-all, residual authority, letting a court issue writs that aren't otherwise covered by a statute. It says that federal courts may issue all writs necessary or appropriate in aid of their respective jurisdictions and agreeable to the usages and principles of law. Back in the 1970s, law enforcement used the AWA to get authorization to install devices called pen registers on telephone company systems. Pen registers record all the phone numbers dialed from the phone line under investigation. The Supreme Court of the United States upheld that usage of the AWA in a 1977 case called U.S. v. New York Telephone Company. Now, since 1986, the U.S. has had a specific federal statute for pen registers, but New York Telephone is still good law, and in our common law system, the Supreme Court's interpretation of the AWA is binding on all the courts below it, all the courts. So that's why decades later, after 1977, federal law enforcement authorities were using the New York Telephone case to try to persuade federal judges around the country that the AWA authorized an order compelling Apple to provide technical assistance in unlocking iPhones. Even though Apple was a third party that wasn't directly involved in the underlying investigation, the government interpreted New York Telephone to authorize third parties to be compelled to assist with criminal investigations so long as three conditions were met. One, the third party isn't too far removed from the underlying matter. Two, its assistance is absolutely necessary. And three, the compelled technical assistance isn't unduly burdensome on that third party. Now here's where I want to turn to Apple versus FBI. In early December 2015, an Islamist terror attack occurred in San Bernardino, California. A man and his wife slaughtered a number of his co-workers at the holiday party. They were later killed by police. After their deaths, the police found the man's iPhone, which was locked. They got a warrant to search it, but the iPhone was running iOS 9, meaning Apple couldn't unlock it for law enforcement. And the police had killed the shooter, meaning there was nobody alive who knew the passcode. This presented an unparalleled opportunity for law enforcement officials to push their going dark agenda. Never mind that, as the FBI director himself had acknowledged, determined sophisticated attackers will always find a way to encrypt their communications and data. Never mind that the San Bernardino shooters kill people with guns, not with smartphones. The idea of terrorism provided the perfect rationale for law enforcement to try to seize back the power they lost when Apple introduced iOS 8. It's much the same as the force that corruption carries here for trying to change the law regarding surveillance and police access to your data in Brazil. It's the same sort of gravity to it as, as you have for corruption here. It wasn't a surprise that the police would make such callous use of a national tragedy. We knew that they were going to do this because the press had recently published earlier last in the summer before the terror attack happened a leaked email that had been sent from the top lawyer for the U.S. intelligence community. In the email, he said that the legislative environment wasn't very crypto, really very friendly to a backdoor bill, but that the environment could turn to be anti-crypto in the event of a terrorist attack or a criminal event where strong encryption can be shown to have hindered law enforcement. And so here now, after just a few months after that email went out, here was the San Bernardino shooting, which at the time was the deadliest terror attack on U.S. soil since 9-11. So to try to make the most of this opportunity, the FBI went to federal court to try to compel Apple to assist. And unlike in the dozens of cases I had mentioned previously, where they had sought orders to uh, Apple to compel them to unlock iPhones, they didn't file the case in secret, they filed it publicly, although this move would turn out to backfire on them. So on February 16th of last year, over two months into the investigation into the terror attack, the FBI got an All Writs Act order to Apple from a magistrate judge in Riverside, California, which is located near San Bernardino. Like the other orders that the government had gotten courts to issue for pre-iOS 8 iPhones, the order cited the All Writs Act, and it told Apple to provide technical assistance to the FBI to help them get access to the phone. But this order for an iOS 9 device was fundamentally different from any AWA phone unlocking order that had ever been seen before. It went much, much further in what it ordered Apple to do. The FBI wanted Apple to make it easier for the FBI to try to brute force guess the passcode. To that end, the order told Apple to create and cryptographically sign a special crippled version of iOS that disables certain security features of iOS 9. There's a limit to 10 wrong passcode guesses after which the phone locks down and it won't let you guess anymore. 
And if an optional feature is turned on the phone, it erases all of its data after 10 wrong guesses. The FBI didn't know if that option was turned on on the phone. There's also an increasing delay between guesses, which is meant to slow down attackers who are trying to guess the password. And Apple also makes the user enter the passcode manually on the phone. But what the FBI wanted was to hook the device up to a computer that can run through every combination of passcodes as fast as it can. So to be clear, none of this involves actually messing with the encryption on the phone. Apple can't decrypt the device, and the FBI wasn't trying to acquire the impossible. The order that the FBI got was entirely about just guessing the passcodes as fast as it possibly can. But that would require Apple to roll back features that it had implemented to keep people from doing just that. That's because for most iPhone owners, the reason they put a passcode on their phones is to keep their devices safe from thieves or hackers or abusive husbands or parents or other snoops. Someone with malicious intentions who got hold of the phone could try to guess the passcode and get into the phone. Apple put those features that I described in place to keep bad actors like that from doing so. But it, in its application for this unprecedented order, the government painted this order as being very modest. They said, it's just this one phone, it's just this one time, we need this to help investigate this terrible terror attack, and it's not burdensome under the All Writs Act because Apple did iOS, it writes software all the time, so it's not a big deal for them to write a little more software. But the order that they crafted, which the judge initially signed, was anything but modest. This case represented a major shift in the FBI's All Writs Act strategy. This time, the US government wasn't trying to compel Apple to do something that the company was already capable of doing and had voluntarily been doing for law enforcement by passing the passcode on devices for the older versions of iOS. That was bad enough. That already ran afoul of the All Writs Act. But this order went even further by stretching the All Writs Act way too far to force Apple to create and sign entirely new software that didn't already exist. And under this theory of the All Writs Act, there's no limit on what the All Writs Act could permit a court to order a third party like Apple to do. Under that rationale, Apple or other smartphone makers or manufacturers of Internet of Things devices, such as smart TVs, all could be compelled to turn their products into surveillance devices for law enforcement. Nothing in the All Writs Act or the New York Telephone case allows third parties to be forced into the service of law enforcement like that. The AWA does not let courts conscript private third parties to do the police's job for them. The government's reasoning would have led to an extreme outcome, which is the commandeering of our consumer devices for surveillance purposes. Plus, this order was squarely at odds with CALEA. When, co when Congress enacted CALEA, it chose not to confer authority on the courts or on law enforcement to compel the assistance that the FBI was seeking. The government can't use the All Writs Act, which as I mentioned is supposed to be a gap-filling authority, to get something that Congress had withheld when it spoke to this area of the law in enacting CALEA. So in short, the government's power just does not go as far as the FBI was asserting that it does. And not only was the order legally wrong, it also raised significant issues of both computer security and public safety more generally. The government claimed it wanted Apple to create this code just for this one phone, just this one time, but there's no way that that would have been true. We know from past experience that when law enforcement requests court authorization to use model surveillance techniques, it justifies the request by claiming it's going to use the technique to investigate only the most serious crimes, but eventually it starts using that technique to investigate much less important crimes. And that would have happened here as well. Plus, the custom iOS code could be misused by the police, not just to monitor criminals, but to monitor political activists, or spy on ex-girlfriends, or what have you. And governments outside of the United States would also want to make Apple create the special code so that they could enforce their own laws. But many countries still have laws on the books that are inconsistent with civil liberties and fundamental human rights, such as being gay, or insulting the king, or following a religion that the state hasn't approved of. And that's who would eventually wind up the target of an order to Apple from a foreign government to create this custom code. It starts with investigating one phone of one dead terrorist in the United States, and it ends with forcing Apple to help an authoritarian government persecute its citizens. And people's fear of their governments itself leads to another security risk. If this order that the government initially got from the court in Riverside had stayed in place, smartphone users in the US and elsewhere might believe that their governments have the ability to force uh, their mobile OS developer to push software updates to their phones that would let the government get access to their data. And that fear might lead people to stop installing automatic software updates, which are crucial to the overall computer security ecosystem. 
Those are software updates that fix actual security flaws, and automatic updates ensure that systems stay patched without us having to think very much about it. But if people stop automatically updating their devices out of fear, those unpatched devices will get hacked, and then in turn they'll spread the infection to other devices. So the fear of getting hacked by the government would lead to a lot of people getting actually hacked by cyber criminals. And yet another risk is that the custom code might get out of the hands of Apple or US law enforcement. Code that could be modified to bypass the code on any iPhone, not just the phone belonging to the target of the investigation, would be a really attractive target to steal or to bribe a corrupt official to sell. It could fall into the hands of hackers and cyber criminals. And that's not just idle speculation. There have been multiple serious data breaches at US federal agencies, including the hack or in disclosure of stockpiles of hacking tools that were used by our own intelligence agencies. So we know that our government is not that great at keeping data secure, and I'm guessing other governments aren't that good at it either. So the fact that the US government has these tools at its disposal for hacking into electronic devices actually wound up being the very thing that resolved the Apple versus FBI case in the end. Um, there were a few really busy weeks after this initial order came out on February 16th of last year. The case became national headline news, probably international news as well. Uh, Apple filed a brief telling the court why the order was burdensome and legally improper. And about 20 different friend of the court briefs were filed by a number of people and organizations, including one that I co-wrote, mostly in support of Apple, telling the court the many reasons why its order was a bad idea. So the court set a hearing date for late March of 2016. But then the day before the hearing, the government notified the court at the 11th hour that it had a third party forensic tool that might let it get access to the phone. So the court postponed the hearing, and a few days later the government confirmed that in fact it had been able to access the phone using this unnamed tool which it had bought from a third party, supposedly for somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars. Since it had access to the phone, it didn't need Apple's help anymore, so the government dropped the case, and the court vacated that really dangerous order it had initially entered, and Apple didn't have to make this custom code. That was a happy ending, but it's left a lot of unanswered questions. We still don't know how the government got into the phone. It never told Apple or the public what the tool was, or what the company was that made it, or what vulnerability in iOS it exploited. So that's still a mystery, and it means there's a weakness in iOS that may not have been patched yet. And, on the legal side, we still don't know what the scope of the All Writs Act is. The court never conducted any legal analysis at all about whether it was proper to issue that incredibly dangerous order to Apple. We don't know what kinds of burden the court can take into account when evaluating whether an order to a third-party company like Apple is too burdensome under the AWA. Nor do we know whether the courts can properly take outside interests into consideration when they're con conducting an analysis under the AWA. As I explained, the order to Apple would have had far-reaching consequences for computer security, as well as international human rights implications. Can the court factor those interests into its analysis, or does it have to ignore them and just focus on the company and the government in front of it? We don't know. But there must be some limitation to what private actors can be ordered to do under the AWA. But because of the way that this case ended, we don't know where those limits lie. The government got the hearing called off at the last minute, so they never had their terrible, outrageous arguments about the AWA tested in open court. And remember, the government sees everything that is asked for as just a preservation of the status quo under which it expects that it is absolutely entitled to access to data. The government believes there is no box that cannot be unlocked, no communication that can't be eavesdropped upon. That's the sort of world that they believe should exist. And they've shown that they're willing to sacrifice everybody's security to live in that world, even though robust security through encryption prevents crimes, too. And because law enforcement agents are starting from a position of limited power under the U.S. Constitution, their incentive is to constantly try to expand that power, even if in their minds they're just preserving the status quo. So that makes me think that the government won't let its embarrassing defeat in the Apple versus FBI case discourage it from continuing to use the courts to try and get more and more power through the expansion of the AWA. The government can keep bringing other cases in other courts in front of other judges until it gets another order, just like the original <coughs> California case gives it what it wants. They can use that order to persuade still other courts that it's proper to issue this kind of an order. And it's almost certain to seek these expansive AWA orders under seal going forward. The government's choice to file the Apple versus FBI case in public turned out to be a massive mistake because even though the case involved a really bad terror attack, public opinion overwhelmingly sided with Apple, and that's not a mistake the government's going to make again. 
And it's been 14 months already since this case ended, so maybe by now, perhaps the government has already gotten orders like this that force Apple or some other company to do what Apple would have had to do in that case or something even worse. There may be a whole body of secret law that we don't know about made by courts under seal, compelling smartphone makers or email service providers or messaging app makers to bypass encryption for law enforcement one way or another. Plus, even if courts reject the government's future attempts to misuse the AWA, the government can use that very rejection to its advantage as well. Because if courts start ruling that the AWA doesn't allow what the FBI wants, then the FBI can go to Congress and argue that there's a need for a new law that does allow it. Remember, the going dark strategy from the FBI and their state and local uh, compatriots has multiple prongs, not just in the courts, but in the legislatures and putting private pressure on companies behind closed doors. So if one of those buttons doesn't work, the government can push on a different button. And as long as they believe that maintaining the status quo of their power means fighting to maintain and even expand their surveillance capabilities, no matter what cost to human privacy or agency, or to computer or even physical security, we should expect that they're going to keep pushing. So that leads me to talking about the WhatsApp cases here in Brazil. Okay. I'm speaking too fast. My apologies. <laughs> I want to leave time for questions. Okay. That leads me to the WhatsApp cases. I want to wrap up with some observations about the power dynamics in playing those cases. Some of them are just like the ones at issue in the US encryption debate, but there's another aspect to them that you're probably very familiar with, but that doesn't come into play in the US debate. So as we all know, WhatsApp was blocked nationwide several times, each time on the order of a single judge in a single court for failure to comply with judicial requests for data relevant to criminal investigations. And those blocks affected 100 million people, or nearly half of Brazil's population. That's an astonishingly far-reaching real-world impact on the basis of just one of the many judicial demands for user data that issue every year from the courts to various internet companies, including WhatsApp. And those blocks were overturned or canceled because blocking access for 100 million people is so clearly out of all proportion to what WhatsApp did. The jailing of a Facebook executive on the order of one of those judges who issued a blocking order was also an extremely aggressive measure to take in response to non-compliance with a court order in a single case. But to me, the lack of proportionality of those responses to WhatsApp's non-compliance seems like it was actually the point Arresting a company officer and ordering the service blocked nationwide was a show of power by those judges after WhatsApp's non-compliance made them feel powerless. Why did they feel powerless? Because WhatsApp refused to hand over data, apparently including the contents of WhatsApp messages. But WhatsApp couldn't produce those contents even if it wanted to, and even if US law hadn't potentially prohibited it from doing so. That's because WhatsApp messages are end-to-end -end encrypted, meaning the company itself can't read the messages or provide them in readable form to the police. That's what made the blocking and jailing seem so unfair to anybody who understood the encryption technology involved. WhatsApp was being punished for not complying with orders that it was impossible for them to comply with. It's like something out of a Kafka novel. Now, to be sure, it's not like there's no historical precedent for evidence to be impossible for investigators to gather. It's always been the case that some information is permanently beyond the reach of law enforcement and the courts. Conversations that we have face-to-face -face in person generally aren't recorded. Documents get lost or destroyed. Witnesses lose their memories or they die or they move away and can't be found. And there's nothing that the state can do about that short of an Orwellian surveillance state so total and so pervasive that privacy and human agency would be impossible. But we're not there yet. We're here, and in the present moment, the courts and law enforcement are struggling to absorb encryption's impact on criminal investigations in both your country and mine. Now, of course a judge won't have somebody arrested because his company won't hand over non-existent recordings of conversations that were never recorded in the first place. It's impossible to produce evidence that never existed, and that's easy for judges to understand. But with end-to-end -end encryption for written communications, a judge knows that the evidence exists, and yet she's told that it's not possible to obtain it through the usual means, such as a search warrant or a wiretap. And that's a new kind of impossibility. And for judges and police who have long been accustomed to wielding great power, it may be very hard to understand 
or accept. So that's how we can understand the response of the judges who blocked WhatsApp and had a Facebook official arrested. It was a demonstration by those judges of an old traditional kind of power. As I said at the beginning, the state is used to having all the power, and the ultimate power of the state is coercion. It can order all of the telecom carriers in the country to block a service, thinking the service will then relent and do as the state wishes. And on that same theory, it can try to force obedience by arresting someone on his way to work and putting him in jail. But when obedience is simply not possible, even coercion doesn't work. But the problem for Brazilian authorities in the WhatsApp cases is not just that end-to-end -end encryption makes it impossible for the company to produce the contents of WhatsApp messages in readable form. Those cases are also about the challenges that countries face when trying to enforce their laws against companies that are headquartered in the United States and operate globally. Now, my colleague Rick Nojime is going to talk to you in a minute about the problems of cross-border data <coughs> demands, and I'm not going to step on his toes, but I want to illuminate another power dynamic in play in the WhatsApp cases. The U.S. is a dominant superpower on the global stage, and it flexes that power in ways that often lead it to be seen as arrogant and ignorant of other societies' needs and values. And that power dynamic and that accompanying tension spills over to the relationships that U.S. tech companies have with other countries where they have users. The companies have data on those users. Investigators in other countries want that data, and they're used to having the power to get what they want. But in the WhatsApp cases, WhatsApp has responded to user data demands by asserting several different limits on power. They assert that WhatsApp does not have the power to hand over the contents of messages because they're end-to-end -end encrypted. They assert that U.S. law limits WhatsApp's power to disclose that information even if they had the ability to do so. That is, that U.S. law is more powerful than Brazilian law and that there are jurisdictional limits on the Brazilian court's power to demand that data from an American company. And unsurprisingly, that response hasn't been super well received in the courts. Uh, in the case of one of the WhatsApp blocking cases, Judge Daniela Barbosa ordered WhatsApp to disable the encryption key or even mount what's called a man-in-the-middle attack in order to make it possible to intercept the contents of WhatsApp messages in readable form. Now, let's put aside the question of whether those things are technically possible. What seemed to anger the judge more than WhatsApp's non-compliance with the terms of the order was the manner in which WhatsApp responded to her order. WhatsApp responded with questions for the court, which it sent via email in English. And I'm going to read the judge's reaction to that, and I'm going to read it in Portuguese. A oficio assinado por esta magistrada contendo a ordem de quebra e interceptação telemáticas das mensagens do aplicativo WhatsApp a referida empresa respondeu a través de email redigido em inglês como se esta fosse a língua oficial deste país em total desprezo às leis nacionais inclusive porque se trata de empresa que possui estabelecida filial no Brasil e portanto sujeita às leis e à língua nacional tratando o país como uma republiqueta como qual parece estar acostumada a tratar so I'm sorry, my Portuguese is really bad. But I wanted to read that instead of the English translation on purpose so that you can like how you felt hearing me butcher your beautiful language to how the judge must have felt when WhatsApp emailed her in English to question the order she had sent them. Now, the, U, the way that U.S. tech companies behave can look just as arrogant as the U.S. government looks when it shows off its power. And I think that maybe in Brazil in particular, this kind of show of power by U.S. companies challenging the power of Brazilian institutions may be seen as a reenactment of the colonial and imperialistic power dynamics which Brazil has spent its entire life as an independent nation trying to move beyond. Not only are U.S. companies resisting the jurisdiction of other countries' law enforcement agencies, but also Law enforcement in the United States now has the authority under our criminal procedure rules to hack into computers anywhere in the world in executing a search warrant under certain circumstances. And yet here's a U.S. company telling Brazilian law enforcement in courts that they can't reach into the United States to compel WhatsApp to follow a court order. So it's understandable that Brazilian courts have responded to the behavior of U.S. internet companies by exercising traditional kinds of power, such as blocking a service or putting somebody in jail. 
The data localization requirements in the Marco Seville are also the assertion of traditional power in response to U.S. companies' claims of jurisdictional limitations on their authority. Now, this looks like a wrestle for power not between police and the people, like I talked about at the beginning, where individuals use new technologies to level the playing field between themselves and the state. It looks like a wrestle for power on the geopolitical level. And geopolitical battles have a regrettable tendency to live, leave out the interests of the actual individual human beings who are affected. That's what the courts that overturn the blocking orders recognize. The display of traditional power by blocking ones that cause collateral damage for millions and millions of Brazilians. The judges who or issued the blocking orders were willing to sacrifice the interest of half the country's population just to show WhatsApp who was boss. Judge Barbosa, who ordered WhatsApp to remove the encryption key and launch a man in the middle of attack, was willing to order WhatsApp to compromise the security of its service in order to make it possible to collect evidence in just one case. And that's very similar to Apple versus FBI, where the FBI was willing to undermine the security of all iPhone users and even the physical safety of users who are in abusive relationships or getting stalked or who are located in authoritarian countries in order to get access to just one phone. Now, neither the Apple versus FBI judge nor the judges who issued the WhatsApp blocking orders seem to really understand that those would be the serious consequences of their actions down the road. Instead, in the battle between the power of the state and the power of encryption, average users who had done no wrong got caught in the crossfire. When the Supreme Federal Court considers the WhatsApp blocking cases in the next few days, there may be a temptation to interpret the Marco Civil in a way that permits the exercise of the blocking power over a U.S. company that has been seen as intransigent and arrogant. Article 11 of the Marco Civil says that Brazilian law must be mandatorily respected, but it's important for the judge justices to remember that upholding the law of Brazil must not mean sacrificing the interests of Brazilians. Privacy, free speech, and safety are fundamental rights, and encryption helps protect them. That's something that police and courts in every country should embrace. It's important that the law, whether the Marco Civil here in Brazil or the All Writs Act in the United States, be interpreted to respect fundamental rights. And so I'm hopeful that the Supreme Federal Court will do the right thing. Thank you very much. Mais uma vez, muito a Diana pela brilhante palestra que coloca realmente em perspectiva é, não só o debate que a gente enfrenta aqui no Brasil sobre criptografia e segurança, como o debate americano que muitas vezes foi citado ah, nas discussões que a gente tem aqui no Brasil ah, como um paralelo ou com, ah, apresentando muitas semelhanças. E acho que isso mostra como de fato essa não é uma discussão ou um embate exclusivo do Brasil, mas que é enfrentado em outros países de maneira muito similar. Então a gente está enfrentando uma questão complexa e difícil que não é uma jabuticaba brasileira. É, e também gostaria de salientar a análise sensível que a Rena conseguiu fazer uh, do caso do WhatsApp, uh, colocando aí as questões inclusive de como uh, soam uh, ou pode soar a, a recusa da empresa de entregar dados para, para as autoridades de investigação e para as autoridades judiciais. Eu vou abrir para perguntas agora. É, talvez é, valha a pena fazer uma rodada de perguntas e depois a Riana é, responde. Então, perguntas. Quem tem perguntas? Uma pergunta ali. Eu vou pedir para terem até aqui porque os microfones não se movem muito. É, e aí é... E aí as mesmas regras do congresso inteiro, se apresentem uma pergunta em estilo tweet. É, inglês ou português? É, meu nome é Giovana, sou aluna do curso de mestrado, pós-graduação aqui na Faculdade de Direito. É, a minha pergunta vai no sentido do que você estava falando sobre essa questão de como são interpretadas as recusas das empresas e como isso afeta até como a criptografia é enxergada, é, se não tem também um outro lado do argumento, que seria que as empresas estão querendo os dois lados da moeda. Elas querem, a gente, é, 
no sentido de que a criptografia se popularizou, nós consumidores temos acesso a ela agora, aparentemente, mas por outro lado não tenho muita certeza de onde vão os dados da minha nuvem, para onde vão os dados do WhatsApp, como que o meu histórico de busca do Google é comercializado, enfim. E parece que essa a posição das empresas uma hora defende a nossa privacidade, uma hora vem de tudo e nós ficamos no meio da, da guerra. Então, como isso também afeta essa, essa percepção da, da criptografia como algo favorável ao consumidor? Talvez eu vou traduzir para a Riane, enquanto isso, pense em mais perguntas, que a gente vai abrir mais um pouco. question. Um, I agree that in general, tech com the U.S. tech companies want to be seen as being very protective of the privacy of their users, but of course they think that U.S. law should govern and that you know, in the U.S. we don't have the default that I think you have here in a lot of European countries where the assumption for business use of consumer data is in the U.S. permitted unless expressly prohibited rather than the reverse of being prohibited unless expressly permitted as it is in a lot of other uh, structures. So I think we're starting from that being the framework where companies think they should be following U.S. law. U.S. law permits this sort of use of data that they have to grapple with um, laws like Marcus Real and laws like they have in the EU that um, really changes the tables on them, but where the markets in, in places where there are 100 million, half the country is using a particular app, of course they want to be able to stay in those markets. Um, but that said, I think that companies like Apple that have positioned themselves as being user privacy friendly are partly doing that because they believe in it, but partly doing it out of a PR effort. Uh, so for example, uh, I mentioned that there were like dozens, 70 or more um, orders to unlock iPhones running pre-iOS 8 versions of iOS. Um, Apple never objected to any of those orders. And in fact, they wrote the language that was in those orders. Um, and it was available in their guidelines, public-facing guidelines for law enforcement, saying if you want to get an unlocking order for a pre-iOS 8 phone, here's the language that you have to get in a court order and then bring that to us and then you unlock it. And there are very good reasons for them to draft that language themselves and to have control over what they could be forced to do so that the police officer couldn't then come back and demand something else and say the order authorized it, even if it wasn't written down specifically in the order. There's good reasons for that, but I think when that fact came out, it became more public after the first, you know, public court cases involving these orders, it might have been a little bit embarrassing because here at the same time Apple was trying to say we're trying to protect users' privacy and that's why we have encryption, that's why we don't want to try and break into this phone. And at the same time, you know, they've been kind of complicit in writing these orders themselves. So I think there's certainly two sides to it where, yeah, I think I, I think that's right. Um, but I do want to sort of emphasize the weird lack of default privacy law that the U.S. has compared to a lot of other countries where everything not forbidden is permitted. Mais perguntas? Uma aqui, uma aqui, uma aqui. Uh, vamos começar do lado de cá. Daniel, Clarissa e Euclides. E acho que agora a gente pode fazer as três. Um em seguida da outra. I'll just stick with English. Okay. Uh, I'm Dan Renato from University of Washington and the Edgar Pay Institute. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about what do you think the prospects are for the U.S. now going forward, because you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you think about what the new administration holds for these issues. I assume it's not good. That's kind of my perspective. And But at the same time, I feel like there has been a lot of opposition and gender as well, a lot of support for organizations like the ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation that are pushing against these kinds of, of movements. So at the same time, I think there's also opportunities there. But I'd be curious to hear your view. I think I agree with your take on it. I think, you know, there's been a push during the last administration to try and get a inclusion protecting bill passed as well. There's 
I think, four members of Congress who have uh, science or technology or engineering or math degrees, like the whole both houses of Congress, four people. And one of them had introduced a bill that would have made it safe and very clear in the law that companies don't have any duty to backdoor their products or to weaken their encryption, uh, including smartphone companies, just not, not just the telecom carriers who are subject to FOLIA. And that didn't really go anywhere. But like I had mentioned, the bills that would have required law enforcement access didn't go anywhere either. And, you know, the Congress was just as divided then and just as in, unable to really get anything done then as they are now. And so I don't like relying simply on like incompetence and internal, you know, problems and, you know, just general gridlock to not be able to get anything done at all. They've not been able to make it happen so far. They have both houses, there's one party controlling both houses of Congress. If they want to, I think potentially they could try and introduce a law, but like you mentioned, and like I think I said earlier, like we haven't seen this level of political engagement from the American public in a really, really long time, certainly not in my lifetime that I can remember. So I think that organizations like the ACLU and the EFF are going to be fighting to limit anything like that that might happen. But honestly, I think right now the government's just too distracted by way too many other daily awful crises going on to be able to turn its attention to something like this. With that said, you know, as the lawyer from the intelligence community had written in an email, you know, maybe if there's another attack, that will be the thing that turns the tides. But I thought it was really heartening that when the Apple versus FBI case came out, that didn't happen. There had just been this really bad terror attack, but nothing happened after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Florida. There wasn't a bill introduced then, it was passed then, so it might take something even worse, which I really hope doesn't happen, to make an anti-crypto bill go anywhere. And even then, perhaps it's doubtful whether this Congress is able to do anything at all. So I guess the answer is... <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Eu vou pedir desculpas para o Euclides e vou ter que encerrar para a gente ter o tempo também dividido com a palestra do Greg, da devida atenção. A gente começou com 15 minutos de atraso, então... A gente está de uma hora para cada um. Queria agradecer mais uma vez a Riana, dizer que foi uma contribuição excelente, especialmente nesse momento em que a gente está discutindo essa questão em preparação para o julgamento do, do Supremo Tribunal Federal. A dizer que a Riana vai estar aqui para o coquetel, que vai ter depois da palestra do Greg, e amanhã também. Então, quem ainda tiver perguntas e não puder ter feito agora, ah, pode abordá-los nesses dois momentos. Ah, e com isso, eu ah, então convido o Greg ah, para ah, se juntar aqui à mesa. Uh, e agradecendo mais uma vez, acho que uma salva de palmas para a Renan.